before we dive into some of the important conversations for our nation in the weeks and months ahead, we wanted to take a moment this week to reflect on some of the most informative, eye-opening, and inspiring interviews on our show from 2021. We had an incredible lineup of guests this past year, such as the Honorable Brian Peckford, former Premier of Newfoundland Labrador and the last living architect of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. We also had Lieutenant Colonel David Redman, one of Canada's leading and strongest emergency preparedness experts. We had Erin Coates, the wife of the first pastor to be jailed in Canada during COVID-19, James Coates, and so many other incredible, distinguished guests speaking to issues for our nation at this time. So we're going to be dedicating this entire show to featuring segments of some of these interviews. We hope that the sound bites will be a good reminder of some very important, some critical insights that we need to keep in mind as we head into 2022. So thank you so much for joining me today. We're so glad that you did. Without further delay, let's get to it. Highlights of 2021. All of these rights and freedoms that are there, there's only one exception where they can be overridden where your rights and my rights as individuals can be surpassed, overridden. And they, we dealt with that in section number one. The Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees the rights and freedoms set out in it subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. I am arguing that everything that every government in Canada has done since the pandemic started, they have not demonstrably justified was needed. And therefore, they didn't have the power to override all of our freedoms and rights. Emergency management is a process that we use in every single emergency. The emergency management organizations watches for the hazards. And what they're looking for is when one of the tubes, and I describe tubes as each sector of our economy, so the energy sector, the agriculture sector, the medical health sector, each of the sectors that make up our economy. And so emergency managers look for a hazard that's gonna affect more than one of the sectors of our economy. At the same time, they're looking to see if it affects more than one order of government, municipal, provincial, or federal. As soon as they see that happening, they kick into gear. And what they do is they bring together the team across all of government, private sector, and anyone else that they need in the room to look at the emergency, bring the best minds together, work through a process, and produce a written plan, which they then implement across all of government. But then in that plan process, what you do is you actually take the plan, tailor it, and produce it and issue it to the public. And you do that for two reasons. Number one, then the public knows its role. And number two, that's the minimum due diligence required before you can inhibit uh, civil rights. Before you can take away Charter of Rights and Freedoms rights, you have to show that you understand that what you're about to do is going to cause less harm than doing something else. And that due diligence process has not been followed and what we've seen is because the medical officer of health is looking at it from a narrow point of view, there's constant changes, constant surprises, constant interruptions. That's because there's no written plan. And that's because the governments, one at a time across 13 jurisdictions, don't actually know what they're planning to do next. For some reason, in this pandemic, we set the AMOs, all the emergency management organizations, to the side and put the medical officer of health in each of our provinces in charge. Now, the medical officer of health is trained to run the medical system, but not anything else and not to collaborate and coordinate with others outside of there, too. That's the role of the EMO. In the first week of March, we could have developed plans for all the different types of long term care homes, plus those living at large in the community. We didn't even try. So, so dealing with the, the long term care homes and the impact on them, 73 percent of the deaths in Canada have happened in long term care homes. Unconscionable to me. Absolutely unconscionable. For the first 90 days of the pandemic, one can understand it was a new it was a new disease, if you will, even though over the years, you know, swine flu, whatever, you can go back and see a lot of them. Fine, okay, you, you give them some allowance, okay. After 90 days or 100 days, there was a lot of information around that governments could have built a framework of combating this um, uh, pandemic without 
taking away people's rights and freedoms. To demonstrably justify this, you've got to let all voices come forward with the full strength. You've got to allow a robust debate in the context of Parliament, which was pretty much cancelled for most of the pandemic. Exactly. Um, and, exactly. and, and, and may the best may the best proof win. Is, is that what you're saying? And is that what you're saying? It, 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 exactly. It was necessary to do something, but it wasn't necessary to do due to draconian measures that a lot of governments have done and that the Canadian government has done and continues to do. That there was a lot of data being accumulated very quickly, that the people who are most vulnerable in this kind of circumstance with this kind of pandemic were the elderly, or the people over 70, but not just people over 70, people over 70 with a number of other ailments or sicknesses which reduced their immunity and made the, uh, the, the COVID more accessible to their system. The first thing that should have been done was to protect the vulnerable, and the vulnerable were the elderly, rather than start, you know, getting into restraining pre people's rights and freedoms under, under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And the Great Barrington Declaration is a good example of this. You know, these three big global experts in epidemiology were the first signatories to the Great Barrington Declaration that ended up having 40 or 50,000 scientists and doctors from all over the world sign it, and hundreds of thousands of concerned citizens sign it. And it said exactly what I just said, protect the vulnerable. You don't have to close the society down to get a handle on this pandemic. And people ignored them. As a matter of fact, some of these very leading epidemiologists were denigrated in the press. Later, have to be backtracked, by the way. So um, that was a, the point at which uh, governments should have taken notes because it was expert speaking. This has been an unprecedented, scary times for pretty much everybody, including physicians. You know, we've never been through this before. I sat down with a group of colleagues during the beginning of the pandemic. We met every week. We actually came up with a list of nutrients that were advised to support your immune health. So that included not just the vitamin D, but vitamin C, uh, selenium, magnesium, and, uh, and other nutrients that, that work together. It's not to say that you know, if you take vitamins, you're not going to get COVID-19, you're not going to get sick. But the key is, if you do get sick, you want your immune system to respond in an optimal fashion so that you will get over the illness adequately without ending up in hospital. You know, this is something that's so easy. It's not expensive. Everyone can do it. You're not going to cause any harm. There's, there really is no downside to this. There is a pastor, Pastor James Cote from Grace Life Church in Edmonton, who is presently in jail. When COVID originally hit, we were like everybody else, kind of scrambling to find out what is this and and really wanting to protect our community and so we followed all of the guidelines that were put in place and then the second lockdown hit and we just thought you know as we're watching suicide rates soar and we're, we're connected within the hospitals with with people that we know and we love and we trust and they're seeing all this stuff happen um, and I know there's trusted doctors. I've read articles from a woman in Ontario and even Dr. Joffe here, that was a part of, from what I understand, Dr. Hinshaw's team um, is also speaking out against the dangers of the lockdowns and what those are producing in the life of people. And we just thought if we're going to be a light to this nation, we have to open our doors and not refuse anybody. And we're going to do that wisely. I don't believe that we have been unwise as a church. We have a protocol in the church. If you are fatigued, if you have a sore throat, if you have the sniffles, if you have a cough, don't come to church. Stay at home for two weeks. Live stream. Um, we also have a, a section where that's plexiglassed off. If anyone feels the need that they have to mask and social distance, that is available to them. AHS started to come to our gathering with the RCMP, I think, middle of December and then they 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 find James and then they after a certain amount of time they locked our door they didn't lock our doors they put a closed sign on our door um and then from there like the RCMP and HS have been in our gathering which is really stressful on our people because there's a lack of freedom um for them to worship because they're constantly worrying about what's going to happen to them and so I so appreciate you just sharing your story because I I firmly believe that in moments like this, Erin, that if we can just hear one another's hearts,
and hear one another's motivations. Though at the end of this interview, people might not agree with how Grace Life has um, walked this whole thing out, but if they can at least hear your hearts, I think that can go a long way to at least uh, keeping us somewhat unified as Canadians and as people. That's what's so difficult about this. It's like, why can't you just go to Zoom? Um, because I wanna, I wanna hold people when when they're grieving. I wanna know their heart. I wanna know, are you okay? And to do that over uh, a camera is so difficult. And I feel like one of the things in the last year that really has happened, and so unfortunately, is going to Zoom. I think there, and and the reason why social media is so crazy is because there's a dehumanization happening. There's a real person behind the 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 issues and, and the people that you're talking to are real people and they have real feelings and so that's something also that we're fighting for um is that the humanity will be brought back to this it's to go against your conscience is neither good nor wise so whether you agree with us or not um, we're fighting for your freedom of conscience. You know, whether people agree or disagree with how you've walked this all out, I think a lot of people are just shocked that James is in jail. I even had some contact with people from high school saying, this isn't the Canada that I grew up in. I can't believe this is happening. Um, and it's not, it's not the country that, that we grew up in. We love Canada and we wanna see it strong for generations to come. That's why we do this show. We can't do it alone. We need your help. Unlike commercial TV, this program is 100% donor funded. If you'd like to see more episodes produced on important issues for our nation, please consider signing up to be a monthly partner or giving a special gift today. Every gift makes a real difference and all gifts are tax deductible. Together, we can build a better Canada for the future. Visit fayteen.tv or call 1-866-844 0844 to donate today. We have to fix urgent problems, but in the long run, we also have to fix the system. This pandemic has provided an opportunity for a reset. This is our chance to accelerate our pre-pandemic efforts to reimagine economic systems that actually address global challenges like extreme poverty, inequality, and climate change. Building back better means getting support to the most vulnerable while maintaining our momentum on reaching the 2030 Agenda piece. Sometimes people hear about this stuff and they say this is all a conspiracy theory or it's all made up, but it's right there uh, in the promo and in the literature. So how would you respond to what's happening here on the international stage, particularly considering that Canada is giving to this? Well, you're right. I think it's important to point out there is a real thing called the Great Reset and you've seen a lot of it here. Um, you know, there are some other ideas that are being imputed to, to it. Uh, we don't even have to go into that territory. We can talk about all the real things that we saw in that video. The prime minister himself kind of let the cat out of the bag in that video. He said the pandemic was an opportunity. I think there's a very curious word. I don't think a lot of people consider the pandemic an opportunity. They consider it a tragedy or a disaster. Um, but he said it's an opportunity to just continue doing the things we always wanted to do anyway. And so he's 
sort of just being very open about the fact that they're just going to use the pandemic as a pretext to pr pursue all the same things that that uh, him and his government wanted to do all along. So in a way, there's really no surprise here. They're just trying to use the pandemic to their political advantage. In this video and this great reset idea, it's as if government has to fix everything. That the whole term reset is if society and the world is a computer and we need institutions like the UN, the World Economic Forum, governments to press this button and it will somehow reshape all our societies. And I think that's an alarming thought to a lot of people. We all accept change uh, over time, but the idea that governments are going to hit a button and sort of turn over the tables on life as we know it, that's a very different thing. Now, Justin Trudeau, in his remarks to the UN, he talked about debt, about people being released from debt. And then in the 2030 prediction video, you see that there's this phrase there that says, in the future, uh, you know, you will own nothing, but you will be happy. What's the ideology here, or what's your read on it? It was a very strange claim. I mean, that was probably the strangest one I saw on that list, that no one will own anything in nine years. Uh, I think that would come as a surprise to a lot of people who own a lot of things today. Are they going to be relieved of those things uh, voluntarily or involuntarily over the next nine years? Uh, you know, I think if the point is maybe we will find ways to do things, for example, if, you know, we get to a place where we have autonomous vehicles, so you don't need to buy a car anymore, you just sort of hail them whenever you want them. That's one thing. But to say no one is going to own anything in nine years seems like a pretty extreme statement. So a child that is born today, their share of the federal debt the minute they enter this world is already over $50,000. It's going to mean higher taxes um, or it's going to mean service cuts. This government, the, the earlier they act, the easier it will be to swallow, but there's no getting around it. The amount of money that we've piled up um, during this pandemic alone is something that we are going to have to reckon with for years to come. Many people's miracle will begin the day they stop being impressed with the size of their problem. What's happening in Canada, what's happening in the U.S., it's beyond my comprehension of an answer, but I know it doesn't catch God off guard. And he has a solution for every situation on the planet. So my responsibility is to begin not as an accuser, but as an intercessor, I plead the case of God, please forgive us. I don't say, oh, God, forgive my president. Oh, God, forgive this person. That. I say, God, forgive us. We have sinned against you. And it's one of the keys, I think, of effective intercession. For the times that we're in, what would be your admonition to senior leaders in the body of Christ right now? Oh, get a backbone. You know, we, we've got to have, we've, as leaders, we've got to be courageous enough to take a stand. Um, sometimes we want favor so badly that we compromise our responsibilities. And uh, we've got to really, we've got to take a strong stand for things that are right without being abrasive, without falling into that political spirit of accusation and the demand of being in control. The church isn't good when we're in charge. Uh, we, we do best when we're servants. And so if we can maintain that servant's heart, but also let our voice be heard. And uh, I, I, I would encourage leaders, prayerfully consider how to, uh, how to uh, be responsible in your own community. Just remember, when in doubt, worship. If you don't know what to do, turn your affection towards him. And just let that time of his presence just rest upon you and recalibrate how you think and what you value, and then live from there. Uh, it's, it's a real simple suggestion, but that really is, uh, I, I would say, perhaps the strength of my life is my adoration for, for the Lord, my affection for him. All the surveys for 2020 indicated higher levels um, than they'd ever ever recorded since they started keeping statistics on mental health. We've now reached 20% of the population are now struggling with a mental illness, with uh, usually depression or anxiety. And there's one really useful tip to help people know if the pandemic has, and all these stresses you just mentioned, Fatim, if this has just tipped your scale into uh, one of these mental health problems, and that is, can you shut the bad thoughts off? But when your serotonin level drops, it's a continuous playback. If you slipped into, I can't shut it off, then don't sit on that. Go and talk to somebody. When God would send his people out before the enemy, he would always send them out with the worshipers, with those that would 
declare and proclaim and lift up who their God was, because that was the demonstration, the manifestation of God in the midst of their trial. And I think for people that are facing circumstances that absolutely look hopeless and that absolutely look like they're, you know, I don't know my way out of this. Trials are not anything new. There's trials throughout the scriptures, and I think we can glean from them as we enter in. And just, you know, the Word of God, I'm like, you know, how do you get into the Word when you're so consumed with exactly what Dr. Dr. Mullen described as the tape of fear? Well, I think you just do whatever you need to do, you know? Go to the house of prayer, get in worship, get around people, get in small groups, get to the church, get, get around other believers that help you align your thoughts I find that actually worship is the fastest way to get into the presence of God to dissipate anxiety. And, and you don't have to be singing out loud. You could have worship music playing in the background. But or even just turning your attention to, to God brings the presence of God. And to me, the presence of God is, a, is just it's the most effective anti-anxiety um, that I've uh, just used myself and what I recommend people to do. One of our greatest assets that we have is the Bible, the Word of God. It's 66 books of firsthand witnesses of people in trial with a God revealing the evidence of who he is. And so what I find is that for a lot of very mature Christians is that they've become so consumed with social media feeds or social um, you know, events taking place that the, this asset's kind of getting set to the side. If waking up in the morning, we're opening up Facebook before we're diving into this great asset, I think there's, there's a problem because the people who are responsible for what we think about is us. There's nobody else. And so how are we feeding our thought life? How are we feeding what's the intake? Because what we gaze upon is what we become. Uh, the online world and social media, everybody has a megaphone, everybody has a platform. With that online world, that common ground is becoming a, a place to fire at each other and to strike at one another. And you're right, it, it, it's a divisive time. It's a, it's a challenging time for sure. The character that Christ calls me to, you know, the fruit of the Spirit that the Bible talks about, love, joy, and peace, and patience, and gentleness, and kindness, self-control, uh, these types of things. Um, I want, to, I want to have that in my conversation with other people. I think what I would encourage someone who's saying, I'm canceling these relationships out, I'm canceling out who, who I'm talking to right now, how's that gonna go five years from now? Just thinking longer term, looking further down the road uh, is really important so that we don't let what's right in front of me become the only thing I can see. I think it's important that we get truth. We need a free country. And in order to have a free country, we should all stand together, shoulder to shoulder, and, and just say, like, I had atheists telling me, I don't agree with your God. I don't believe in what you say, but I absolutely believe in your freedom. When there is censorship of the news, when our government makes decisions, but don't even show us the facts, they've got to recognize that the government works for we, the people, and that we didn't vote them in because we thought they were smarter than us. We didn't want them to make decisions for us. We wanted them there to help us stay a safe, blessed country, to maintain our freedoms so that all of the brilliant minds and people and leaders that are in business and arts and education could rise up. We are educated people. We are not stupid people. The brilliant way to lead, whether it is churches, businesses, provinces, or nations, is to treat people as a smart group. There's a big job ahead of us as leaders to equip the people for the work of nation building, for the work of, of raising up strong culture that loves one another and allows us to have different ways of believing and thinking and thriving. So there's such a vacuum, please rise up. What I love about you, Sandra, is I, I feel like you're a picture of 
literally millions of Canadians and thousands of Canadians that watch this show who are genuinely concerned. So you just got up off the couch and you started getting involved in something called an EDA. It's easy for me to sit back and say, oh, I don't like this and I don't like that and just complain and be negative, but not do anything about it. When I heard your interview with Doug last February, I was really inspired because he explained how we could come to the table with voices and opinions to protect the vulnerable. The next day was our uh, EDA, Electoral District Association, annual meeting. So we brought forward uh, a proposal on euthanasia that talks about uh, being opposed to the extension of uh, euthanasia and assisted suicide to minors, to people who are not competent, and people who live with psychological suffering. The results were, I believe, uh, eight for and seven against. That's the power of one person showing up. You never know if you're going to be that one person. So because of your one vote, Sandra, there's going to be an opportunity for people at that convention to vote in favor of a resolution that will protect the most vulnerable. And then that can possibly translate, translate directly to how the Conservative caucus will vote on forthcoming or present legislation on assisted suicide. It was like that first pebble that creates this, this incredible ripple. And I, I really want to accent this because so many people feel powerless. So many people feel like, you know, what can I do? But you are a picture, Sandra, of somebody who just showed up and we have no idea where the full ripple effect of that one vote that you cast will land. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope that you enjoyed the program. And if you'd like to watch it again or share it with your friends, you can go to fateen.tv and view this show or the full versions of these episodes or any other show for that matter at your convenience right there. We also want to say thank you so much for standing with us financially. As many of you know, we are a nonprofit media organization that is able to broadcast these conversations across Canada every week because of the generous donations of our monthly partners and our regular donors. And maybe you gave in 2021 but aren't yet a monthly partner. If you appreciate the content, we would like to invite you to consider becoming a part of our team, joining that monthly partnership team, or if you're already a monthly partner, maybe increasing just a little bit or giving a special gift as you're able. We want you to know that every single amount makes a huge difference and is appreciated. Simply call our team at 1-866-844-0844 or visit fateen.tv and we'd be honored to chat with you, to pray for you and to serve you in any way that you need. Thank you so much for loving Canada. Thank you so much for valuing these conversations and we hope to see you again next week.